the church confesses its faith when it bears a present witness to God's grace in Jesus Christ. Thus begins the second of our final four confessional standards in our series, the Confession of 1967, or as it's often abbreviated, C67. This is the first confessional document written for and by U.S. Presbyterians, in our Book of Confessions, that is, And it's the reason that our denomination has a book of confessions to begin with. Being that this is an explicitly Presbyterian document, it probably won't surprise you to learn that it was written by a committee over a seven-year period. And then upon approval as a draft by the 177th General Assembly in 1967, sent back to Presbyteries for study, as well as a special committee of 15 for revision. The initial committee was chaired by the Princeton professor, Edward A. Downey Jr., who then actually went on to write a book about that and the composition of the Book of Confessions itself. And the special committee of 15 was chaired by W. Sherman Skinner. Again, being Presbyterian, It took a while to create a new confession that was both decent and in order. The committee chaired by Dr. Downey began its work after its appointment by the 170th General Assembly in 1958. It was given a first read by the 177th General Assembly in 1965 and finally approved in the 179th General Assembly in 1967, hence its name. C67 is probably best known as a work speaking of and to reconciliation at a time when it seemed that everything from American societal values to theology, particularly reformed theology itself, was up in the air. It's structured around 2 Corinthians 5.19. In other words, God was reconciling the word to himself through Christ, not by counting people's sins against them. He has trusted us with this message of reconciliation. C67 finds inspiration in the work of the primary author of our previous confession, Karl Barth. And it's meant to very much address the role that the church has in contemporary society, in the modern world. As such, it addresses such issues as biblical authority, national security and peace among nations, the equality of persons, both in terms of gender and race, as well as speaking against racial discrimination. And throughout all of these issues that this confession addresses, the overall theme of reconciliation is paramount to this confession. The three parts of this confession, God's work of reconciliation, the ministry of reconciliation, and the fulfillment of reconciliation, all point directly to this. However, within each of these sections, even with all that in mind, we still find some of the individual topics that we've heard from before, from grace to God's love, to the Holy Spirit, to the mission of the church, including revelation and reconciliation, there's that word again, in society, to the equipment of church, including prayer and preaching and the sacraments. The organizing theme of reconciliation provides a structure through which this confession navigates its mid-20th century world. The short answer is that it was written after the merger of two Presbyterian denominations in the North, the Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, the first national denomination, which dated back to 1789, and the smaller United Presbyterian Church of North America, which was about a century old at the time. They joined together to form the United Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, the UPC USA, in 1958. This denomination became one of the two mainline Presbyterian denominations in the U.S., which then, of course, in 1983, would have a reunion and come together to form our current denomination. The more complicated answer has to do with the Westminster Standard. 
By the time we get to the late 19th century, they were becoming a bit of an issue. The church was wrestling theologically with what it is we believed, and that played out in terms of, well, people being tried for heresy and losing their jobs and people splitting. It was, it was, it was rough. Not like in the olden days when people were actually getting killed, but people's lives were being affected by these theological debates within the church. We were wrestling with what we believed, and in the context of the early 20th, early 20th century, what do we believe about God and the Bible in the context of societal change and suffrage and scientific advances, understandings of evolution, all of that was up in the air and on the minds of Presbyterians. And the church really seemed stuck on the issue of biblical authority. Indeed, the fundamentalism that we know today as American Christians was kind of codified by one of our ancestor denominations a century ago. More liberal pastors and theologians balked at the idea of these so-called five fundamentals. And the majority of the church, comprised of moderates, were much more interested in upholding the peace and unity of the church than the sort of ongoing general assembly after general assembly fight between this minority of liberals and this minority of conservatives for whom these issues were paramount. And by the time we get to the 1950s, the need to replace a 300-year-old confessional standard from Britain, it, a lot of people sort of got that. And so upon this reunion, it was decided that it was time to draft a contemporary statement of faith for the new church, the UPC USA, rather than attempting to just refine and edit again the Westminster standards. The committee very much wrote this statement to address their context, as Jack Rogers explains. Quote, the Confession of 1967 also constituted a new beginning in the expression of Reformed confessional statements. All creeds, confessions, and declarations of the Reformed tradition arose in the context of social and political controversy. Each of these implicitly addressed the issues of their time in ways which the authors and their original recipients understood. But the Confession of 1967 was the first reform statement overtly and explicitly to name and confront current social problems of its own era. Thus, the Confession of 1967 provided the church with a clear theological orientation by which to meet central social issues of the 1960s and 70s." End quote. This confession was not without controversy, as you might imagine, especially in that context which at this point was well over 50 years old between liberal and conservative. Indeed, a group of Presbyterian elders and laymen, who also happened to be captains of 20th century industry and executives in some of the corporations you've probably heard of, met in the office of a president of one of the major oil companies in New York City to respond. And they did so by organizing and composing full-page ads in publications like the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post to protest the inclusion of C-67, along with the fact that the church would have something to say on social matters, which was a big deal to them. Um, and also, to be fair, there was a problem theologically with a lot of the more conservatives over the insistence that it is Christ who is the word of God and not the Bible. That was one of the major controversies with C-67. The confession can also be a stumbling block for Presbyterians today as being a mid 20th century document it relies exclusively on very masculine language. However, in 2002, the General Assembly provided an inclusive language version, which um, is something that I have used in worship settings before and it does a better job at addressing the he, 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 he that we find in the original language. Friends, thanks again for joining me as we go through our book of confessions. Um, I hope this is fun for you. This has been fun for me as well. Next week, we shift to the global south for our penultimate confession. Um, the Belhar Confession, or excuse me, the Confession of Belhar. Interestingly enough, that is the newest addition to our book of confessions. It hasn't been heard widely in the church because it's only really been around for about a decade or so. 
But it's, all, but it's not the newest written confession, which we will end our series with. Thank you for joining me, and as always, take care and be well.